Hey internet, this is Adam for realhomerecording.com. In this video, I'm going to talk about a very important topic, and that is recording studio contracts and what you should have in them. If you are thinking about running your own studio or you already have a studio opened, this is what you should be including in your contract. If you aren't using written contracts, well, eventually you're going to run into a problem where you wish you had one, so you really should start. So first of all, I'm not a lawyer, so seek professional help to get your contract in order. These are just suggestions, and this video is for informational purposes only. So don't sue me if something goes wrong, <laughs> because I'm not a lawyer. First of all, in your contract, you need to outline exactly what the scope of the project is. Your client needs to tell you how many songs they want to record or mix or master, whatever. How many instruments that they will probably have in each song. How many vocals? Will it just be a lead vocal with a few courses? Or are you going to have a whole choir in your studio? Are you recording, mixing, or both? You might even be doing mastering. Explain to your clients who a lot of times have no idea what you do, what the differences are between those three aspects of production. What are your clients' expectations? Are you going to just record them? Do they want you to be a producer as well and give you that type of feedback? If they don't know what to expect, then you need to lay that out for them. Number two, deliverables. You need to know what exactly the deliverables are. Are they going to be recorded tracks with no processing? Are you going to deliver just the finished mixes or will it be the finished mixes plus consolidated tracks and session files? Will those deliverables be burned onto a CD or DVD and shipped to the client or will they be shipped out to a mastering house or will they be put on a hard drive, a thumb drive, or uploaded to some server? Sent via email? Messenger pigeon? All this needs to be in the contract because you don't want to all of a sudden have to pay some overnight FedEx fee because that's what, how they want their stuff delivered. No, that needs to be all up front so you can charge clients accordingly. Okay, number three. How long will you hold on to the tracks? You don't want to be responsible for digging up tracks that you recorded a decade ago. <laughs> you might not have to hold on to them at all if that's what you put in the contract. Typically, I will hold on to things for six months without an issue. I actually tend to burn everything that I do onto Blu-ray disc as data or just as a hard drive. I usually have two copies because you never know when that disc will get scratched or that hard drive will fail and then all your work goes to nothing, right? If you don't practice things like that, like I do, if you're a really busy studio where buying a ton of hard drives every year is going to be cost prohibitive, then you need to get that in the contract that says you're only responsible for holding the tracks for X amount of time. And then after that, tough luck. If you're charging by the hour, which you should be, trust me, do not record people at a flat rate. It is a mistake. If you're charging by the hour, does equipment setup time count or is that free? Is the book time continuous? Do you charge for lunch breaks? Are there lunch breaks or dinner breaks? That's up to you and the client to negotiate. I do count setup time in the hourly charge because I'm working. You know, if I'm taking gear around and micing up and, and getting a good sound, that's my skills and knowledge being put into place. And that's labor. Uh, lunch, I don't charge for lunch breaks because with the exception of if I'm eating lunch while recording the client, then absolutely they're being charged. Um, you know, working through the lunch break, I don't know if you guys do nine to five jobs, but at a nine to five job, they will try to say, oh, well, work through your lunch break. was like, well, you're not paying me to eat lunch. So a break should be a break. Um, and, and anybody who puts up with that shit at a nine to five job, I feel sorry for you guys. Downtime due to equipment failure. Now, here's where this becomes fair. If there is an equipment failure and it happens, that downtime is not included. So if 
you know, your computer breaks and you have to hold up a session for a week, I don't know, <laughs> then the client gets a free day of recording or whatever. Now, if this happens, this is where having um, business insurance comes in handy because if you do have downtime due to equipment failure, you may lose money and you can claim that money as a loss, as an insurance loss, if you're covered for that. Put this clause in the contract. The security of the artist's possessions are their sole responsibility. If they lose some kind of fancy guitar pick or um, something gets stolen, who knows? They leave stuff at the studio, which really they shouldn't. But if they happen to leave stuff at the studio and somebody breaks into your studio and, and takes it, you really don't want to be responsible for their vintage guitar that could cost you a lot of money. Um, so yeah, put that clause in there so that you don't get sued for things that you didn't do. Is smoking allowed in your studio or not? I would say you shouldn't because smoke on audio gear is bad, especially condenser microphones. Credit. How are they going to credit you? And now this is something that I don't really enforce that much because it's not that huge of a deal, except when a CD is made, then I definitely want to have credit in the liner notes. And um, yeah, so how, how should you be credited? I like to be credited with my full name, not my middle name. I don't really care about that. Full name, studio name, and studio website address. A right to cure clause. Now that's some legalese. Right to cure means that if you messed up, you have a right to fix that. They can't just turn around and say, you messed up. I'm not going to give you a second chance to fix it. That's a bunch of crap. Typically, if you are taken to court, a judge will ask, did you give that person a chance to fix their mistake? Um, I don't know if, depending on what state you live in, there might be right to cure laws in place. But if you get right to cure put in the contract, then uh, you can definitely say, look, they didn't give me a chance to fix what I messed up. Hey, mess ups happen. It happens. We're humans. But we should be given a chance to fix mistakes. Revisions. This is a big one because you don't want to end up in what's called the endless mix. This kind of goes back to the right to cure. Revisions are going to happen. You know, typically what I'll do if I get a mix or if I get, a, you know, a session file, I will mix a track. And what I'll usually do is ask the client, you know, what do you want to sound like? Give me some song examples and I'll go look those songs up on YouTube or if I had them in my CD collection or MP3 collection, I'll listen to those songs to get an idea of what they're going for as far as sounds concerned. Because to me, I like having a clear mix where you can hear every note, everything is nice and clear and even in volume level, but they might not want that for some reason. For some artistic reason, they might they may want to sound like a garage band. Uh, St. Anger from Metallica is a good example of that. Uh, that album sounds like it was recorded not in my basement, in somebody else's basement. <laughs> and it just sounds like... It doesn't sound like Metallica should, should sound. Um, but anyway, that was their decision. That was their artistic decision to sound like a garage band. So if that's what your client wants, that's what they get. Anyway, yeah, make sure that you have the amount of revisions in the contract. Revisions, I usually say up to two revisions on the mix. So I have the client listen to the mix. You know, they I send them an MP3 file. Now what I'll do, because the way that I do my payment schedule, I get a retainer up front, not a deposit. Legally, a deposit can be taken back. A retainer is a different legal word that is money that is paid to retain your services and that cannot be refunded. I get a retainer before I even start the mix or start the recording. If I'm doing a recording, then uh, the final payment is due at the time of the recording. If I'm doing a mix, the second third of a payment is due upon delivery of the first mix, which the first mix will not be that. Well, first of all, what I, what I tend to do is I'll put in the name of my studio. I'll put a voiceover in where I'm like, you know, realhomerecording.com, and then they can't release the track. It's like a watermark until the final payment's delivered. Now, if they pay 
all the money up front, which I do mix for a flat fee. If they pay all the money up front, then they'll get a mix that doesn't have those watermarks in them. But you want to make sure that you're going to get paid and they're not going to, they're not just going to take your tracks and not pay that final payment. It's a way to protect you. And, you know, there should be really no issue with that unless you have a shady individual that you're working with, uh, which there are a lot of those out there, unfortunately. But, you know, you can tell I've had some experience in this before. Um, but yeah, that's how I, I handle things. And I haven't really had a problem with payments because if they want their tracks then they got to pay for it and I'll hold on to one of those tracks and they won't get paid or, you know, if I, if I don't get paid, I, I hold on to their, those tracks and we're even Steven. It kind of sucks that I wasted time mixing a song, but at least I got that retainer up front. So yeah, two revisions. And if they want more than two revisions, it's an hourly rate, which you can set in the contract uh, so that there's no disagreements after the fact. Usually I'll do, depending on how many tracks there are, and this, again, this comes down to the scope of the project, I'm not going to charge the same hourly fee to change a track that has 50 tracks in it versus one that only has two or one. And if I'm going to fix a voiceover, I'm not going to charge as much. But if I'm going to have to fix something that has 50 tracks or more, uh, which I rarely do that amount, usually my songs vary between 16 to 24 tracks of audio, um, which in that case, I charge about $35 an hour for something that's only like two or three tracks. It's 20 to 25. But uh, yeah, you can set your own rates and, you know, mine might be small compared to yours or it might be a lot, but, you know, my time is worth what I put on it and that might go up in the future. It might not. Who knows? It's all up to you. It's all up to me. Okay. This is called the amendments clause. And this is another important one. These are all important, but right to cure and the amendments clause, I think are probably the most important because what you should state in the amendments clause is that the written contract is the final ultimate agreement and that any modifications to the agreement must be made in writing with both parties full signatures and you want to make sure that happens because a lot of times and i've seen this i've sat in on court cases they'll say well he told me blah 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 or she told me blah 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 blah. it doesn't matter what you say because number one it's hard to prove what somebody said which is why you need to have that in the contract that says that any oral agreements it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if somebody you know, use smoke signals to change the agreement. It doesn't matter because the amendments clause says that the written contract is the ultimate agreement. All right. Copyright and use of the music for studio marketing. Who owns, who retains the ownership? If you go on the big guys websites, they'll have samples of, um, well, really more like a, a credits list because it's easy for you to listen to their music. But when you're working with indie bands, which if you're like me, that's typically who you work with. I'm not working with big name rock stars or big pop artists. I'm working with somebody that you wouldn't know the name of because their not, name is not in tabloids or on TV or on the radio. So in order for me to sell my services, I need to have examples of my work. In the contract, I get that I can use between a 30 second to one minute sample of their music for marketing purposes. And uh, also they can choose to keep copyright of their own music. By default, the person who recorded the music has copyright of it. Although they own their own music, you own the recordings to that music by default. So you want to negotiate that as well. Notice of cancellation. How much time will you give them to say, oh, can't make it? Now, this is where a retainer comes in handy because if you booked a date and had to cancel on somebody else, again, this this comes down to once your name gets out there and you start getting clients, you know, you got to book dates. So let's say, you know, October 20th, 2015 or whatever, you booked a date for a band to record them. And they say, oh, we can't make it now. Well, that would be terrible if you didn't have a retainer. If you do have a retainer, then you're, you know, you, you hopefully covered your own fees for that day. Because what, what happens is, what if somebody else wanted to book October 20th, 2015? Well, you turned away work. 
you turned away a band or a musician who would have been a fully paying musician. So a uh, notice of cancellation, um, I've seen anywhere between two weeks notice to 48 hours, 96 hours. That's up to you. But regardless, what tends to happen is, well, it's, it's a little hard to enforce this, but if that person cancels last minute, like literally last minute, they call you like a half hour before their recording time and they say they can't make it. Well, they need to be able to pay the full price if they want to record with you in the future. But again, it's hard to enforce this because they could be like, well, we're going to go to some other studio. And to be honest with you, if you're going to have a client like that, you may as well just say, you know, whatever. Cut your losses because that person is probably going to be wishy washy. So that's about it, guys. If you have any other tips for your fellow studio owners, please leave them in the comments below. I'm sure I missed a few things. And like I said, I'm not a lawyer, so this is only for informational purposes. You really should contact an attorney to get them to draw you up a boiler, I believe it's called a boilerplate contract so that you can go in there and modify things like clients' names and hours and all that. You just need to make sure that your bases are covered. Also, you can look at other studios' contracts that are online and see what they have in there. That's what I did um, when I was doing photography pretty hardcore. I had taken contracts from other photographers who had good contracts. And basically I compiled my contract from like 10 different sources. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you don't have to have a lawyer to draw up your contracts for you. It's just important that you have a contract, a written contract to avoid any legal issues. Oh, one more thing. You might want to have a litigation contract that says that any disagreements will go in front of a magistrate judge and not a normal judge. It's a little bit cheaper to have <laughs> a magistrate judge. So, um, but like I said, that's where you got to talk to a lawyer about that stuff because I'm sure I missed a few things and specific things may not apply to you depending on what country you live in or what state you live in. So there you go. This has been Adam for Real Home Recording. Dot com.